Hi, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, What is New with State Authorization? My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Manager of Programs and Events here at WCET. We have a lot of content to get through, and we're going to hold questions till the end. So if you have any questions, do feel free to enter them into the question box, and we'll answer them as we can. If by chance we don't get through all of the questions today, I'll be sure to pull those out and share them with the presenters and provide written responses back to you, along with a link to the archive and any resources that are shared. You can access today's PowerPoint presentation by clicking on the handout box and downloading that PDF. Also, follow the Twitter feed at hashtag WCETWebcast. Today we'll run through some state updates talk about the long and winding road of state authorization. Russ will give us a federal update. We'll talk about Sarah, and then we'll get to your questions. As mentioned previously, we'll be sure to keep an eye on the question and answer box, and then we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. If there's a lot of questions on the same topic, we'll interject as we need. We have two very experienced and wonderful moderators today. Russ Poulin is the Director of Policy and Analysis here at WCET, and Cheryl Dowd, who many of you know, directs the State Authorization Network here at WCET. So I'd like to go ahead and pass it off to Cheryl. Thank you very much, Megan. We're very excited to start our web series with our first webinar today, What's New with State Authorization? And uh, as you may have seen, we have two more webinars scheduled for this summer, and then there will be three in the fall. Uh, you can find the information on those um, at the WCET um, website under SAN Events. And before we move on, I'd like to introduce the rest of the presenters for today. We're fortunate to have three a very experienced people in state authorization and knowledgeable in SARA. First, we will have Joel Tobin, who is the Compliance Analyst and Project Manager at the University of Washington. And we have Sandy Doran, who is the SARA Director, SARA Regional Director for NSARA. And then Kylie Danchise Curtis, who is the Program and Outreach Coordinator for NSARA. As Megan was saying, we have a lot of information to get through today, and I think it's going to be very um, helpful for all of you doing this compliance work. And I'm up first. So um, because you all know that with state authorization, the core of state authorization is state compliance for activities of the institution which occur in other states. The state is the center. And so because of that, we like to look at what the state updates are because we're seeing that there are a variety of changes which occur within the state regulations or perhaps the interpretation of the regulations in the state, so how they're uh, requiring compliance uh, based on their regulations. And because of that, we've pulled together some information from a variety of states that have had uh, changes um, or modifications over the past academic year. And I'm going to do these in alphabetical order. And uh, some of these, if you're a part of the State Authorization Network, you've heard these reported before. Um, but I wanted to be able to reiterate those because they, have, they are changes and trends that we have seen uh, throughout the last uh, academic year. Starting with Delaware. Um, many of you are aware that Delaware um, has just become a SARA state. Actually, its effective date is September 1st, and it'll start taking applications ex on September 1st. And uh, I just share with you those dates, but Sandy Dorham will be able to share with you more information about how Delaware will implement SARA in their state. More importantly, what we have found with Delaware is that although they were formerly a state that did not regulate online learning, they now are regulating online courses and institutions must seek authorization either as a SARA institution or through the traditional authorization path in the state of Delaware. Out-of-state institutions only um, offering experiential learning but not offering courses or degrees do not need to apply for authorization. This is actually a change as well. So out-of-state institutions who um, have someone who's doing face-to-face -face in another state but come to Delaware only to do the experiential learning, they do not have to be authorized to be able to complete that experiential learning. If you have any questions, uh, this is the email address that they have suggested that you um, correspond with. The District of Columbia is another new SARA state. 
they are a July 1st effective date and a July 1st application um, acceptance date. And again, Sarah, Sandy will provide more information about that. But what I wanted to share here is that the District of Columbia may be implementing a new set of requirements, but currently what they are requiring of institutions to offer 100% online courses to submit answers to the 11 questions that you'll find on that web link that you see before you. And also, um, in regard to experiential learning, they ask that you submit an application for conditional exemption. And that application is at the link that is provided there. And may I note that when you look at the different options, that the link will be for a foreign institution, which doesn't necessarily um, pop out as the first, uh, first, first thought that you would use for the exemption. However, it's, a fo it's foreign to the District of Columbia, and that is why you choose that exemption. I wish that was shared with me by the regulator in that location. That is when you are providing um, the District of Columbia with a traditional application for um, activities to occur in the District of Columbia. Moving on to the next state, Maryland. Um, these are not a set of new regulations or new implementations, but what I wanted to share with you is that we have um, a number of changes in the hierarchy at, um, at the MEC. And uh, these are the, uh, the different people. You'll want to perhaps download this. I know many of us used to um, correspond with Jackie Cade quite a bit, um, but now you're seeing that they have moved some of the positions and have different people in different responsibilities. So if you need to correspond with people, please note that there have been some changes into the responsibilities of some of their staff members and correspond with the appropriate person. Okay, moving on to the next set of states. In Massachusetts. Massachusetts, it was about a year ago that this came into play. Uh, Massachusetts uh, used to regulate it, um, experiential learning. Uh, they required that uh, you have to um, apply and they would um, consider experiential learning to trigger physical presence in that state. They have made a decision that physical presence does not generally include experiential learning unless there is some other physical presence trigger um, that causes um, the requirement to be regulated. Specifically, faculty is not a trigger of physical presence. We've been communicating with Kristen Stone um, in Massachusetts and she is her email is provided there. The state of Michigan is a relatively new SARA state. They became a SARA state um, towards the end of 2015. And they are a state that did not formally regulate online learning. They now regulate online learning. So institutions that are not SARA institutions must seek authorization uh, if they are offering online courses to students in the state of Michigan. However, experiential learning, faculty teaching from an out of state, and advertising are not deemed activities that require authorization. The materials for Michigan can be found at the link below, and you'll also see that the forms and publications link are provided on this slide as well. Moving to the next, North Carolina is a new Sarah state. Those of you that, that heard this announcement, I think two Fridays ago, will recall that North Carolina um, had an effective date of June 13th, and they will start to accept applications for North Carolina institutions on October 1st. The importance of this situation in North Carolina is to share with you that formerly, North Carolina offered a teach-out option for field experiences that would occur in the state of North Carolina. However, they have decided to discontinue that practice. The, uh, the understanding was that when the federal rule came out several years ago, they were providing kind of a grace period for institutions to become in compliance and would allow institutions to seek a one-off type of situation with a teach-out option um, for the students who find themselves in that position in the state of North Carolina. However, that practice has been discontinued with the few exceptions, and it has to do with a student who is in the military 
and is transferred to North Carolina during their program of studies or a student moves to North Carolina during their program of studies. And I bring this to your attention because what we're talking about is the student who began their program in another state where they were legitimately and um, permitted to be able to complete the program in that state. However, especially in the military situation, they are now posted in North Carolina and that was not something that could have been anticipated and therefore are in a position that they need to be able to complete the program. North Carolina will work with students who must complete because they are finding themselves in North Carolina due to some sort of transfer after they are already in a program that they began in another state. And the contact in the state of North Carolina is Terrence Scarborough. You can contact him at the email address hyperlinked on the um, slide. And in the state of Oregon, Oregon has been a SARA state for a little while now. Um, the interesting part about Oregon is that those of us that have been doing state authorization work for a few years will recall years ago um, that they regulated online or had some kind of registration with a fee. And then they decided that um, they were not going to regulate online learning and there was no fee. There was an exclusionary rule. Now the real exclusionary rule has been repealed and that institutions offering online courses must seek approval and pay the, the $7,000 fee biennially. And I point this out because if you are not a SARA institution and must follow this process, the exclusionary rule in the state of Oregon has been repealed and you must seek authorization and pay the fee. There are surety bond requirements for those that are not a part of SARA and um, you may follow that process that is provided um, in the hyperlink and um, the process in general is explained about out-of-state institutions under the hyperlink that is also a part of this link. Okay, the last um, update that I wanted to provide for you is in regard to Puerto Rico. They have a new application for um, an exemption for higher education institutions. You may contact this new contact person, Marta Cole Riviera, um, at the email address that is offered on this slide. And that is all of the updates that we have from the states and territories currently. Um, I will um, point out to you that you may see with the new states that have become SARA states that Sandy will talk about, there may be some changes in, in regulation or some changes in implementation that you'll want to stay aware of. The State Authorization Network tries to keep its ear to the ground and provide that kind of information to its members on a regular basis. So moving on to our next area, we have Joel Tobin, who is, as I said, the Compliance Analyst and Project Manager at the University of Washington. He's going to explain to us the long and winding road of state authorization. Thank you, Joel. Thanks so much, Cheryl. So this information for many of you is old news. I will state that right up front. But uh, for those of you who are uh, new members to WCET, new members to SAN, or if your institutions are just getting started on your state authorization journey, here's a quick review. And lots of us who have been working in the state authorization world for a number of years believe that it's helpful to have a little bit of an understanding of what happened beginning in 2008 and how we got where we are today. So just a quick run through. So in August of 2008, the Higher Education Act was reauthorized as the Higher Education Opportunity Act. And for those of you who don't know, the HEOA guides the Department of Education in drafting specific rules that are designed to implement the provisions of the HEOA. In June 2010, the Department of Education released the original state authorization language for comment as part of its negotiated rulemaking process. Notably, there was no language concerning dist distance education included in that draft rule. In October 2010, the final wording of the state authorization rule, rule was released, and it, it included the now infamous language of Section 600.9c that applied to providers of distance education, and it established, as a, established a very short timeline for compliance with the new regulation. 
in January of 2011, litigation over that language and other provisions of the program integrity rules uh, became part of a case called Association of Private Sector Colleges and Universities v. Duncan. Lots of you will probably remember that at that time the Secretary of Education was Arnie Duncan. Uh, and just in case anybody is following along closely, APSCU is now known as Career Education Colleges and Universities, or CECU. They recently changed their name. Then, in March and April of 2011, the Department of Education published its famous Dear Colleague Letters, which provided guidance for institutional compliance and, in many ways, muddied the water even further. The deadline for compliance, however, was extended, and lots of institutions breathed a temporary sigh of relief. In July 2011, the U.S. District Court ruled on APSCU versus Duncan and struck down the distant education portion of the state authorization regulation because the Department of Education had failed to follow its own rulemaking processes. It's important to note that this was a procedural error and not a substantive one, and that that's the reason the court struck down the state authorization language. In 2000 and I'm sorry, in June of 2012, the U.S. Court of Appeals affirmed the lower court's ruling in APSCU versus Duncan. And for all of us who've been working in this area for a number of years, the state authorization regulation 600.9c was essentially effectively dead at that point. In July of 2012, the Department of Education confirmed that it would no longer seek to enforce state authorization requirements for providers of distance education uh, through another dear colleague letter. And significantly in August 2013, something really big, really important, and really exciting happened, and that was the launch of the National Council for State Authorization Reciprocity Agreements, or NCSERA. In June 2014, about a year later, Another national, uh, I'm sorry, another negotiated rulemaking committee had been established, and it failed to reach consensus on language for a new state authorization regulation for providers of distance or online ed. The Department of Education announced shortly thereafter that it would pause, quote unquote, any further efforts at regulation. So, fast forward to just this month, June of 2016. As of now, you're going to hear more about this from uh, Sandy and Kylie going uh, just ahead, and you heard a bit from Cheryl just now. Forty states plus Washington, D.C. are now approved to operate under CERA, which is really, really exciting. And then, guess what? In June 2016, the Department of Education submitted a new state authorization rule to the Office of Management and Budget, which is the beginning of the rolling of the procedural ball, which will potentially wind up with the implementation of a new state authorization rule. So what do we know today? Megan, you can advance to the next slide when you're ready. Thank you. So what we know today is one key thing, one truth remains. State regulations of colleges and universities have been in place for decades, and institutions should seek proper approval in any state where students are being served. That This is not new. And the effect of 600.9c was essentially to shine a light on the significant number of institutions that were not and had not been in compliance with state laws and regulations. And uh, as a very smart person I know likes to say, once that toothpaste was out of the tube, there was no going back. What we do know is that proactive and diligent management of an institution's compliance, compliance obligations has always been a best practice, and that includes all a college or university's compliance obligations. All of those with federal and state laws uh, are, are in place, and compliance and all the work that goes into the compliance is just a part of doing business. State authorization essentially shouldn't be treated any differently than compliance with Title IV or Title IX or even the local fire and building safety codes that apply to your institution wherever it has operations. It is true that state authorization can be a complex compliance goal and for many institutions it's been an elusive one, particularly for those of us who are at large complex research institutions with uh, activities in many states, countries around the world, and don't necessarily have an easy way to keep up with what's going on at our institution.
institutions as they change and evolve. So yes, state authorization can be complex, but as we've said for years, your college or university simply cannot stick its metaphorical head in the sand. Compliance is required, and that's just the way it is. If you're just now getting up to speed or participating in a WCET SAN event for the first time, I can tell you you are definitely in the right place and there are lots of super smart people available to help you. So let's talk about a few tips for getting started and for staying in compliance. The most important thing you can do, and I feel confident that Cheryl and Russ and lots of other folks would back me up on this, is that you really must know your institution. And what that means is that you're out on your campus, you're talking to faculty, you're talking to staff, administrators that work in all the areas of your institution that might have some kind of trigger activity going on with regard to state authorization. So you'll need to talk to folks in academic units about current and planned program activities, not just those things that are happening today, but the things that could be happening down the road that you should be thinking about uh, now before they actually begin to take place and give you any kind of a compliance problem. You should be aware of requirements that attach to, Megan, if you would be so kind, I think um, we went ahead a slide or two. That's the one, thank you so much. Um, so as I was saying, you should be uh, aware of requirements that attach to professional and licensure programs. Uh, a couple of examples, nursing, health information management, social work, teacher education, and lots of healthcare programs. Uh, we don't have time today to discuss this in great detail, but there are lots of intersections with professional and licensure program programs with individual state boards in the states where your students are enrolled, and of course there will also be state authorization concerns as well. Be aware of out-of-state internships, practica, field experiences, and their specific needs. Many of your institutions know or will be happy to know that SARA covers some of those kinds of activities, but the rules are very, very specific and don't necessarily cover everything your institution might be doing. You should learn about that and know what could be covered. Very importantly, you should be aware of all the other triggers for physical presence in state, states outside of your institution's home state, and those can include anything from marketing and advertising to recruiting, third-party agreements or contracts, and employing faculty in other states. One of the most famous phrases of state authorization compliance is, it depends, and the triggers for physical presence with regard to all those things I just mentioned are unique for each of your institutions, and that's the, the point, the original point about getting out and talking to people on your campus and finding out what's going on you can't know all the things you might need to know about those potential triggers unless you're aware of what your institution is going and where its activities are taking place. Another very important thing you want to keep in mind is that a number of accreditors, the Higher Learning Commission is but one example, now ask about state authorization compliance as part of their required documentation. So you can expect that as part of a renewal or an accreditation review, you may find your accreditor asking for information and therefore documentation that shows that your institution holds the proper and requisite state authorization approvals. A proactive determination whether SARA is a good fit for your institution could also be considered a best practice. Since the new rule that we're going to hear more about from Russ coming up in just a few minutes will, likely most, will most likely recognize SARA membership as a compliance option. Depending on what your institution is doing and what its plans are going forward, SARA isn't right for every institution, but with 40 plus states now offering SARA as an option, it's probably a good one for most of those who are listening in on the call today. So two musts that you'll want to keep in mind. As I said before, and I can't say it enough times, you must communicate with all the relevant departments on your campus, the registrar, any office that serves military students, business departments that handle third-party provider contracts, all of those could be key to figuring out what your institution's profile and activities are in a given state. Figure out which department manages state authorization compliance on your campus and go talk to them if that's not you. It could be through the, that, could, that function could happen through the provost's office, a dean's office, 
a distance education or online office. I'm new to the University of Washington and I learned last year that state authorization on our campus is handled by the Office of the Vice Provost for Educational Outreach. Who knew? The second must, develop strategies to determine your student's location and where the institution offers programs or services. The really important thing that you should be thinking about is that your institution needs to have a defensible practice and what that means is defensible to regulators if they inquire what you're doing and where your students are as to how it makes those determinations about where students are located. Your institution could potentially consider a census date each year or each term in terms of pinpointing exactly where your students are located at a given time. It's not enough just to use their home addresses and then forget about it. And to make this happen, you'll likely need to talk to your data warehouse, your enrollment management or IT folks, and to figure out the processes and practices that will need to go with that. So next slide, please, Megan. So the best defense really is staying connected and getting educated. As we said before, burying your head in the sand is never going to move your state authorization compliance goals forward. So just a couple of quick recommendations. Uh, as I said before, I can tell you with absolute certainty, having known all the great folks at WCET and WCET SAN for a number of years, that they are a tremendous resource. Russ is plugged in all over the country and particularly in Washington, D.C. to lots of things that are going on and it's amazing over the years how often I have heard information about very recent developments in the state authorization world first from Russ. So that's a great thing to do. You should also make a habit of reading the Chronicle when you can and also Inside Higher Ed. I've been reading Inside Higher Ed every day for the last almost five years and I can't tell you how often I have gotten the tip about something new and important that's coming down the road and that I could put that on a list of things to do or to be aware of so that I don't forget about it and that I can stay as in touch and in the know as I can. You also might think about looking at your uh, college or university's newspapers and even your local paper. I'm amazed at how often I've learned some things about what my institution is doing just by reading the Seattle Times. Another great practice is finding colleagues and friends who are interested in a mutually supportive approach and talking to them on a regular basis. Cheryl likes to refer to these folks as state authorization buddies and I couldn't have said it better. It's just a really great way to go because there are folks all around the country who know a lot of things. Some of them know either more or less than you do about particular topics and it really requires a broad network of folks to keep the information that you need front and center and to be aware of things as they're changing while your institution has an opportunity to proactively respond and to make sure that you're remaining, you'll need those folks. One of the things that I would definitely recommend to folks is think about a strategy for staying connected and getting education that makes sense for you and for your role at your institution. Not every institution has you know, one, two, three, four, five FTEs who are dealing with state authorization concerns. I've met lots and lots of people over the year who are 0.25 or 0.5 or 0.6 handling state authorization and they have lots and lots of other responsibilities in their various roles. One great practice I encountered a number of years ago was a person who was brand new to state authorization. I met her at a, at a WCET conference and she looked like a deer in the headlights. As it happened, she was at a Jesuit institution in California and she had what was, I believe, truly a brilliant idea in that she reached out to other Jesuit institutions, particularly those in the West, to find folks on those campuses who knew some things about state authorization and could get her started since all those institutions have a number of things in common. This would also be a great practice for any of you, whether your institution is large like mine, we have 45,000 students on three campuses in Western Washington, or a small institution that has 5,000 students in um, just a very limited area, perhaps the Midwest, or has a really tiny campus with you know, maybe 1,000 students, but you have online or distance ed students all over the country. You need to know the folks who, have, who are part of an institution that looks like yours. That's the best way to learn. One other thing I'll mention really quickly is in the state of Ohio, 
uh, a bunch of really smart folks established an organization called the State Authorization Network of, of Ohio, and SANO has been operating for a number of years now and has been an incredible resource for local folks in Ohio at all different kinds of institutions, ranging, ranging from those very large and those very small and unique. And that's been a great resource for all of those folks. And I encourage anyone in a state where you would find that worthwhile to do something similar. Finally, attend as many conferences as you can, particularly anything that's put on by WCET, and networking events. Those are great places to talk to folks who are actively engaged in doing state authorization compliance and other kinds of compliance as well. Get trained at the SAN event. Talk to folks who know what they're doing and learn from them in any way you can because there will be amazing opportunities to adopt some of those same practices in ways that work best for your institution. Thank you so much for your time today. I want to thank my colleague here at the University of Washington, John Hogel, for his support in putting together my presentation. And I'll turn everything over to Russ. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joel. Uh, so glad to have you with us today. And, and thank you, everyone. And now that Joel said good things about all the things that I know, I'm going to go on for a bit about all the things that I don't know. Uh, let's move to the, the next slide, because we're going to talk about uh, these federal regulations coming back there. And, and on this, you can see just a very um, quick version of, of what Joel just went, went through with his long and winding road that he had, had there. But really, we're at the point where the Department of Education uh, looks like they're planning to bring back the federal regulation. Um, I, I've not talked to anyone in the higher ed community uh, who's been contacted by them in the last year, by the department in the last year about this. And so uh, many of us were surprised that they were doing this. Um, we're thinking that uh, they're likely to uh, 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 issue the regulation for comment in the, uh, the next few weeks and that the comment period will probably be uh, fairly short uh, because they're trying to, uh, my guess is they're trying to make a uh, uh, deadline of getting the regulation out by uh, October 30th. If they don't do it by October 30th this year, they have to wait till October 30th next year. And my guess is, is that they're trying to uh, clear out this and other regulations before the uh, administration leaves. And so uh, moving to the next slide, that, that what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about uh, what we think might be in uh, this regulation. I probably should have put a crystal ball instead of the capital as the picture uh, up there. But really, since I haven't talked to anyone, we're thinking that for the most part they're going to go back to what they proposed in the failed negotiated rulemaking from two years ago. Um, that so it'll probably look a bit like that. And so some of the things they hear the first item demonstrating compliance for financial aid purposes, and so for that, that if you have students in another state who are uh, receiving federal financial aid, you need to be able to. Uh, demonstrate that you have the uh, approval of that state or are operating legally in that state for those students to continue to get to get aid um, and uh, and that is that is something that they'll start start looking for probably we're hoping that it might not be for a couple of years yet before they start uh, uh, checking on that but it probably won't be too long because we've all known about this for so long so not quite sure when they will uh, implement that that regulation we'll have to watch here. Uh, second thing, supporting reciprocity that in the past the department has been uh, very supportive of reciprocity. They may have some some tweaks on that but uh, expect them, they can't endorse SARA in particular but they can endorse the concept of reciprocity. Uh, next, uh, there'll be an ex they want to put in an exemption for the military and their spouses and children uh, so that they would they would be able to move from place to place. Unfortunately, that puts them at odds with state law. But maybe we can work together with the states to try to make uh, uh, make those the state laws and the, and the uh, federal law in harmony, harmony, especially for military uh, moving uh, from place to place. Since most states, uh, if you talk to them long enough, that they'll allow the military to move from from place to place. Uh, some other things on the next slide uh, that that will we'll maybe see is that one of the big sticking points was that, as Cheryl said before, uh, there's this notion of uh, exemptions is what it's called. It's really, really what it is is that some states do not uh, regulate, let's say, public institutions or some nonprofit institutions 
who are all they do in the state is offer distance education. Uh, the department wanted to do away with that and wanted each state to actively review every institution so they you wouldn't be allowed to just say well, I'm a public and I'm accredited and and all I'm doing is distance ed and you'd be okay in that state and so um, that will cause probably 30 or so states to have to change their uh, change their laws and then uh, probably one of the most controversial I think will be uh, uh, this one that uh, well I support the notion is this is about programs that lead uh, to licensure so like nursing or teacher education or medical technology or any of a host of health career uh, areas that in those programs that you have to notify students in advance about whether you meet the academic requirements your program meets the academic requirements in uh, in the state in which the student is located and that's kind of a difficult thing for some uh, some programs in some areas and some states don't respond to you so we'll have to see how that works out and also that the way they had it written into the uh, 2014 proposed rules that this would be not only for distance ed programs but for all programs on campus let me say that again for all face-to-face -face programs and distance ed programs that you'd have to do that notification and so uh, that won't be popular among some people uh, let's move on to the next slide uh, this is something that actually is in place now this is not the, remember everything we talked about before we're Department of Education rules that are coming we'll let you know about those uh, Department of Defense though uh, if you're part of the uh, memorandum of understanding uh, for students who receive tuition assistance that's a type of uh, uh, Department of Defense aid for those who are uh, active duty military uh, that they already are checking right now so this is something that they are checking to see whether institutions uh, uh, have authorizations in the states in which they are uh, serving the military personnel so that's out there uh, and that's come out in just the last few years uh, the on the next slide uh, just some last words for me about what what you should be doing how do you move uh, forward and I'll be writing some more more about this but here's a time to start thinking about that first one uh, and what I mean by that is that if you've known that there's some state where you consistently have 30 students or you're doing something out of face and you just you just haven't bothered to get the uh, uh, the approvals over there uh, you may want to start thinking about those and what you're going to do about that and whether uh, um, whether you'll be covered by Sarah or whether or not or whether you need additional approvals because you go you go beyond uh, what Sarah allows in the state and so start thinking about any places where uh, you might have uh, vulnerabilities and then thinking about a plan about how you'd move forward and then uh, start informing your leadership uh, 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 whether it be uh, you know your boss's uh, provost legal counsel th those people about uh, that will give them the heads up that this may be uh, uh, coming, that this federal regulations may be coming and there'd be some changes there and uh, prepare to comment uh, uh, because if they do put in some things that we uh, support or if we should support those and if there's things that uh, we don't like uh, we should provide alternatives or, or let them know that we don't like it uh, and if they are trying to make that October deadline um, I guess is that I, I wouldn't be surprised to see only 30 days for a, for a comment period and so we need to be prepared for that and then also I will uh, as quickly as I can try to uh, uh, provide on our blog some ways in which you can how you can comment and some things you might want to say uh, if you do comment and you can comment as an institution or you can comment individually uh, outside of your institution you can do that uh, both ways uh, with that, I'm going to leave you with some resources on the next page, uh, just some links to go to of some uh, things where you can find uh, find more more information about uh, what it is that we're working on, including our our blog. We always try to keep up the the latest things that are going on uh, on that blog, plus a lot of other things going on. Just instead, with that, uh, I'm going to move to our friends from. Uh, New England, Sandy and Kylie are going to give us the latest on the state authorization reciprocity agreement. So, Sandy and Kylie, I'll turn it to you. Terrific. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Russ. Uh, my name is Sandy Doran. I'm the Sarah Program and Policy Director for the New England Board of Higher Education, 
And with me, as Russ said, is Kylie Danchise Curtis, who is our SARA coordinator. So we are both available uh, today and every day hereafter. You have your our contact information uh, will be revealed on the last slide. So please feel free to contact either of us for additional information. So in front of you is a map, but before we take a look at the map, I would just like to give you three or four high-level uh, metrics. The first is, as has been number, mentioned numerous times, 40 states and the District of Columbia are now members of SARA. Um, when you think that this initiative began in 2013, we first began accepting states in 2014, um, it really has been a, a phenomenal 24 months. So congratulations to everyone that's been involved in this effort. Uh, the second metric is SARA institutions. So we are currently approaching nationwide 1,000 member institutions. The breakdown is 63% are public institutions, so that means uh, state universities, flagship universities, community colleges. 32% are independent nonprofits. Those, so those would be your um, colleges and universities who belong primarily to independent college associations, nonprofits. And then 5% of the membership are for profit institutions. Uh, the third metric is infrastructure. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit uh, further on, but it is important to know that as, as NC SARA continues to grow, um, our processes are strengthened, our infrastructure is strengthened, and our reporting mechanisms are all strengthened. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the key data reporting requirements uh, in a minute. And then the fourth note, the fourth high-level metric, is that by the end of this year, by the end of 2016, only a handful of states uh, will be non-SARA states. So if you are an institution um, in one of these uh, non-SARA states, then you will need to continue to go through the state authorization uh, process, as well as SARA, as you've heard, just doesn't address certain issues. For example, licensure. Uh, teacher ed certification, things of that nature. All of that will still need uh, to receive authorization from individual states, but the general um, distance education, online education that SARA seeks to cover uh, will, be, will be covered by SARA. So looking at this great map in front of us, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is the approach for today will be to address those states, those 10 states, that essentially are not SARA members. So Wisconsin and Utah have already submitted their applications and those will be heard by their compacts and their regional steering committees over the next 60 to 90 days. Pennsylvania and Kentucky are also on the verge of submitting their applications and those will be heard uh, this fall. States that are preparing applications and we believe will be um, we'll have submitted their applications by the end of this calendar year and be heard uh, by their regional steering committees will be Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, and we also have a high degree of confidence in New York. Uh, New York passed legislation last August, the governor signed it, and since then they've been working diligently uh, through their regulatory process to, uh, to provide a vehicle for, for SARA institutions uh, to submit their applications. So that will all take place this fall. The, the three states that are still uh, in discussion amongst themselves and debating the best route and trying to find the best mechanisms for moving forward are California, Florida, and Massachusetts. Megan, the next slide, please. So what's ahead for SARA? We've got several big initiatives underway. The complaint and improvement reporting process is uh, underway now, and there will be some global results, some trends, as well as individual enrollment reports that will be available. And all of this information will be published on uh, the NC SARA website. So it is really important 
that, um, that that website be checked periodically because all the information that I'm sharing with you today also uh, will be recorded on that website. Uh, we are going to continue to add states and institutions, as I mentioned, and importantly, uh, Sarah has earned from the IRS a tax exempt 501c3 status. And again, what this means is it just strengthens the organization from an internal point of view, um, allows us to work seamlessly with other funders and other organizations like Lumina, like Gates, like WCET, like the other regional compacts, um, as well as SHEOs and private institutions. So it, it was a really important step, not just from a legal perspective, but also from a policy perspective. Next slide. So terrific. So all of our contact information is on the NC Sarah website. Oh, there you go. As well as our individual contact information. Um, but the resource that I just referenced is www.nc-sara.org. And we seek to have that information as current as possible. But if you have questions uh, that are not answered adequately there or you need some additional detail around some of the things uh, that we presented today, please reach out to us. Okay, thank you very much. Cheryl, I'll turn this back to you. And Cheryl, just make sure to unmute as you take us through the Q&A. Yes. Yes, thank you. And I'm looking for the Q&A, and I found the first question. The first question, actually, before, um, there is one more. I thought there was one more um, slide, Megan, that had some activities that would be coming forward, because this has to do with one of the questions that, um, there we go, um, learn more and stay connected. Um, this is a message that has come through from Russ, from me, from Joel, from Sandy, um, and Kylie. Um, be aware that there are opportunities for you for participating in activities. And these activities include the WCET annual meeting. Those that are coordinators in SAN, there's a special SAN coordinator face-to-face -face meeting that occurs on the morning of the first day of the annual meeting. And then there is a compliance workshop. Somebody was asking, how do we get trained at what kind of an event? Well, WCET periodically holds a, SAN, a state authorization compliance workshop. And in those workshops, we bring um, experts in the field, and we have room for about 50 participants, and those participants are able to have mentors, and we will work through the, the, the overall topics of state authorization to try to help each person with their institution's particular needs develop a compliance plan strategy for their institution. So, you know, we provide general information in a webinar such as today or in some of the uh, reports and blogs that you see. But what you're able to do with these compliance workshops is bring your particular concerns and issues from your institution to the workshop and be able to work with people to understand what you can do to work within your institution's needs and create a plan that's directly related to your needs. And that, um, the next one that we have planned is November 2nd and 3rd. Um, it will be in Cleveland, Ohio, and there is a web page that's set up for that currently, and that's link, that link is here. However, the registration is not open yet. I anticipate it being open the first week of July. So they fill up quickly, um, but they're a very worthy um, workshop for you to consider. Um, we, we just completed what we called an advanced topics workshop, and what we did there was the opportunity to provide institutions people from institutions who have a deeper knowledge of state authorization, who want to dig deeper into a topic area. And they came to this so that we could really grasp, in this case it was SARA implementation and also about professional licensure. We will be creating another um, advanced topics workshop probably for next spring or summer um, once we learn what the really important topics are moving forward because that advanced topics workshop may change its topic from time to time but the compliance workshop is to help benefit the institution create what they need for their institution okay Megan could you show me where I could find the other questions 
Sure, there's a question pane and you might just need to expand it. Uh, Barb Zirkin did have a couple questions, starting with really rudimentary question about state authorization and does this mean that only online programs must seek specific authorization? So I think that's a great question that probably many, many people had. That's a great question. Um, this kind of situation has to do with all activities of an institution that occur in another state. There were a lot of um, a lot of folks that thought that this was only about online learning when this came came into play several years ago. However, I must make sure that we underscore the idea that this has to do with activities that occur in a state separate from the state of the institution. And that is where the institution must determine what the, the compliance requirements are to allow that activity to occur in another state. We're talking about activities such as marketing, recruiting, um, faculty who teach a course from another state, um, online learning of course, and when I say experiential learning, I'm talking about field field experiences, internships, you know, the, the generalized term for that. I know there are different definitions, but what we're talking about is a physical experience of, an in, of a person in another state, so an internship, a clinical, things of that sort. Um, the, and what Russ pointed out is this has to do not only with online programs that may have recruiting or marketing or um, experiential learning, this has to do with face-to-face -face as well. Great, and then there were several questions about Sarah, and I don't know if our uh, if Sandy wants to take that question, but the question was, if we are a Sarah institution, do these uh, state authorization um, regulations affect us? I think it depends on the program. So for example, specific state regulations uh, that relate to either licensure or teacher education of thing or things of that nature will affect you regardless of whether your institution is a Sarah uh, institution or not. Cheryl, do you want to expand on that? Well, I, I, I that is true. Um, yes, uh, that that is the situation, and you would want to um, review that as well. But what I also would encourage you to do is stay aware of what activities your institution is 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 doing um, because you're going to have to explain to your institution why you would want to remain um, a member of SARA um, and that would be only for the higher ed education requirements when you as Sandy points out if you have um, if you have situations where you need to supply um, a registration with Secretary of State that is outside the higher ed agency requirements if there is a requirement for um, licensing um, types of approvals, then you're going to have to go to the licensing board. So there are things that are separate from what the higher ed board um, requires. And for example, when I gave the, um, the updates in regard to the states, those are for the folks that have to follow the compliance requirements in those states because they are not SARA members. Under SARA, then they have a uniform set of standards. But if they are a non-SARA institution, then they must comply with the traditional requirements of that state. Does that answer the question? Let me add something. This is Russ. Let me add one thing to that, too. Then we haven't mentioned face-to-face uh, uh, -face activities in a state. If you start doing substantial face-to-face -face activities, uh, and you suddenly find that you have one of your colleges within your university is providing a degree program in another state and they've rented a Marriott or something to do this, that that, that is now outside of Sarah and you'll need to worry about authorization. Thank you, Russ. That's a good point. Okay, moving on. And I just want to address the audience with two quick things. If you're wondering where the handouts are, there's a handout pane. On my menu, it's toward the bottom, but you should be able to expand on that, and then you can download the PDF of the slides. I'll also be sending the slides out along with a link to this recording. So if you need to duck out at the top of the hour, uh, do know that we'll continue to record and we'll send the recording out to you as soon as it's available, usually by the end of the week. So moving on, we do have quite a bit of questions and, and keep adding your questions. We'll get to as many as we can today. Uh, there, we all know that DC is a little unique and there's several questions about DC. One is from Lauren, any information about supplemental information required by DC in their SARA application for DC institutions? Sandy, do you want to take that? 
Thank you. So the District of Columbia is a, as we know, is a recent uh, member state and they have uh, created, of course all states, I should take a step back, all states uh, must use the standard institutional application. So what would be best uh, is to refer that question to Mary Larson. Mary Larson is the liaison with SREB and she has worked very closely with the District of Columbia in this CERA work. So her contact information is on the last page and I would encourage uh, the questionnaire, quest, questioner uh, to reach out to her directly. Oh, Great. I don't see it. Okay. Yeah, so it's, her, it's not on there, but I'll be sure to include it. Okay, thank you. And uh, as a secondary source, she is also on the nc.sara.org website. So she would have the most current information. Great, and I'm just going to keep going in order here. What is the effective date of North Carolina's decision not to allow teach-outs? Oh, the effective date was last summer. What they told us last summer when we inquired was that they would permit people who had already received approvals to complete the approval they had received, but that they were not providing any more approvals for teach out unless it was the special circumstance that I had already mentioned. So they are not providing any new approvals for the teach out unless they meet those certain criteria that I discussed. Great. Well, and it looks like quite a few of these questions are getting uh, written in responses too, which is great. Helps us get responses to as many as we can. There is a question, has Kentucky's governor signed the legislation? Um, I'm assuming that's in regards to Sarah. Yes, the answer is yes. And in fact, Kentucky uh, is on the verge of submitting their application, which we believe will be heard in October um, by the SREB uh, Regional Compact. So the legislation has been signed and that's, is in effect. Well, that's great news. And what about, what's the status of Puerto Rico joining Sarah? Puerto Rico, uh, that's a great question because our colleagues are in Puerto Rico uh, as we speak, talking with the department there. Um, there are several states and territories which are currently not affiliated with a compact. Uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania has signed an affiliation agreement with SREB and is preparing their application, so they have affiliated. And Puerto Rico is considering uh, affiliating with SREB, and that's why my colleagues are there today. So we will have more information on that progress in uh, probably 60 days. Great, and they can just follow up with you, Sandy, for more. Absolutely. May I also offer that the NC Sarah website is a wealth of information. There is actually a chart that when you go to the main page of the NC Sarah website, there is a hyperlink to a chart that shows states that have had legislation already passed. It has a column, states that have submitted their application to Sarah's, and also the dates of the effective dates of those states um, when they became members of Sarah. Right. Thank you very much for that, Cheryl. That's an important resource. Okay, Joel, I hope you're still with us. This is a question for you from Nikki. Could you give an example or examples of third-party contracts that would need to be considered? Oh, that's a terrific question, and you bet I'm happy to take that. So uh, we're all aware uh, these days that there are all kinds of services and um, administrative functions that your department may choose to um, work through a third party to do. And uh, to the questioner, one of those, one example might be is that there might be some kind of a third party in a state other than the one where your institution is located that is coordinating and handling all of the details of a summer field experience for, oh, let's say 15 students are going to travel to another state to participate in a six-week field experience. And the field experience alone could, in fact, be a trigger, uh, depending on what is involved with that. But if your institution is going to work through that third-party entity for all of the logistical details of getting that trip set up 
And let's say that that uh, is going to be something that happens on an annual basis or maybe even a number of times annually that a group of 10, 12, 15 students will be traveling to that state, then that's the kind of thing that in some states might in fact function as a trigger for authorization. Even if, let's imagine a scenario where the students are actually in the state for a very short period of time, and depending on some states' um, uh, regulations, that may not actually be a trigger, the actual education program the students are in, but working with that third-party provider, it might. And I, of course, welcome Cheryl and, and Russ, if you have thoughts on this as well, to jump in. Okay. Hearing none, I'll go ahead and jump to the next question. This is from our friend Jason Piat. Question for Russ. Regarding the concept of the feds possibly not allowing exemptions, wouldn't this be di very difficult for the feds to impose on the states given our long history of the states having say and how they handle things at their local level? Oh boy, that's a good one. That's a really good uh, question, Jason, because they actually can't impose things on the state. What they can do is that they can do uh, backdoor measures in terms of trying to uh, entice the states to try to uh, uh, put in these sorts of measures and so and here's where we have a, 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 a problem with this as well because let's let's think about there was the state authorization regulation for institutions within a state and some states didn't have the proper complaint processes or didn't have the proper oversight and even though it took a while and even that took a while um, to get those all in place, and, and some of them still are not, as I found out uh, in the last few weeks. But it's a lot. What the uh, leverage was was that institutions within that state would 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 not be eligible for federal financial aid, and so uh, legislators and governors would be very interested in trying to comply to make sure that those institutions got federal financial aid. So it's not a, a direct imposition. Uh, they can't force them to do it, but they're enticing them to do it uh, through aid. Now, the problem with that is, is that, so let's use a state like, I mean, Colorado. Colorado, now what this does is you're trying to get Colorado to change its laws for institutions from outside the state. Um, kind of a problem, because I might actually like that uh, institutions from outside the state. Uh, coming in and so I might drag my feet on that one and so um, that is a problem with the uh, state authorization for distance education regulation and then using that backdoor method for it so uh, that's it's a very complex topic it's a good question Jason but uh, uh, in brief uh, you're correct they can't force it they can only entice Excellent. And I think we'll just get to one more question here. We've reached our time limit and we're getting more questions than we're going to have time for today. So I'll be sure that we get written responses to all these questions and then get them back out to you as soon as possible. Um, there is one more question I want to address regarding Title IV money. Will the feds be interested in each student receiving aid regardless of how many students are in that state? I know of we only reported activity of 10 or more in a state for Sarah, but I'm assuming there's not a limit in the number of students in a state for Title IV purposes. You people are asking really good questions, and, and if, they, if they go with what was in the, uh, the last version, uh, that there, there was a minimum, but there was a, it was a minimum that never applied. <laughs> Uh, so it was very confusing for people because the way it was written, it was a minimum of 30 students or the state law, whichever was tougher. Okay, well, we could, in, in every case, it was that if you're getting into a, a state and the state had to, by their definition, had to actively review you, they, there is no... Uh, what's called de minimis, no minimum in any in any state that they, if you have just one student, that they review you. Uh, so they may put that back in there. It may be confusing, but but really the idea is at least you know from the, from the uh, states uh, when they look at it that they figure if you have one student in the state uh, that every student gets consumer protection, they want to review you. 
uh, and I and I think that's kind of where the Department of Ed is going to fall on the same sort of thing. If they're giving money for an activity in a state, that they're going to want to make sure that somebody's overseeing that activity. And I think that's the way it's going to going to go eventually. Again, confusing. Sorry, but that's the way it is. So thanks. And back to you, Megan. Okay, and I, I take that back. I think there's one more question that's really worth addressing during this conversation because I think a lot of people tend to sit back and say, well, what are they going to do? What are the consequences? So the question is, what has been the worst penalty given to an institution for not acquiring state authorization? And that will be our final question today. Well, that's that's a good one because, you know, I, you know what happens is, is that uh, – so in – institution is found to be uh, out of compliance. The, the regulators for most state, what they do, their job is to get the institution into compliance. And one of, one of two things happens is that uh, either the institution agrees not to take any more students and falls into compliance, or the other thing that happens is that they uh, agree not to take any more students in the, in the state and that they, they do that. And then what tends to happen is is that there ends up being a non-disclosure agreement over whatever happens. <laughs> and so we don't know um, we don't know uh, usually what, what goes what would happen there uh, or what sort of fines uh, coming on. And so and then I do remember that it, it wasn't about an institution uh, uh, that well, it was about an institution that had was applying for approval. Uh, but it had started advertising in the state before it had the approval, and I heard that one southern state had uh, fined that institution seventy thousand uh, dollars just because they put an ad in the Sunday paper in the major uh, major state in that. And I've also heard, especially on advertising, um, that uh, some other states have gone after. Uh, and now it's one thing where that they can go after them. They can go after them for. Uh, for for advertising when you don't have approval, and I've heard of some uh, uh, fines for those sorts of things that they've gone gone after them. And so, uh, and then as much as anything, that I've also if it's if it's a licensure program, that probably worse than fines from the states have been uh, substantial lawsuits uh, by students who get partway through the program and find that they've lost not only their money for uh, tuition and fees, but the time um, that they took is wasted uh, in going into that and that there's been some, uh, um, I've heard, I, I don't have specific numbers, but I've heard from people who knew that there was some, uh, quite a bit of money that changed hands over, over, over that. Um, uh, Joel or, or, um, or Cheryl, any others that want to weigh in on that? Well, just say... I think what we try to share with the institutions is that it's important to understand that this is the law, and uh, to try and we work with institutions that you know try to ha try to offer a high moral, ethical standard, and knowingly be out of compliance is not just because uh, we don't think that we'll get caught um, is not an an advantageous role to take. We want to support our students. We want to help them. Um, move through the programs. We've heard of students who um, will pursue a program much like what Russ was saying, only to find out that they um, that the state would not accept um, an online program in teaching, say for example, from a certain state. That that's not acceptable within their licensure program. So you know you, you need to weigh these things out. You need to understand that this is the right thing to do. Um, regardless of what you think you know about compliance standards and what you think you know about um, who has been um, held responsible and what their fines may have been. We also talk about um, the concern that we have for bad publicity. Um, we know that uh, that sometimes word gets out about an institution that may be out of compliance and then that the story could get distorted and then that's a black mark against the institution and we don't want that occurring either. Um, Joel, do you have any other areas that you've heard in terms of uh, compliance um, failures? No, I, I, I think not, Cheryl, but the one thing I think I would add to the, the terrific remarks from both you and from Russ is that, um, just for example, um, I work here at the University of Washington in the Department of Compliance and Risk Services, and compliance is certainly important, but that risk part is also important, and 
one of the things that I've talked to folks about over the years is that this is a risk, but that it's really hard for any individual or any institution to quantify exactly what that risk looks like. And as Cheryl so you know, aptly said, it's just not something that you, you need to do, so why would you do it? Doesn't your institution want to operate along the lines of the best practices that the United States' best college and universities employ, wouldn't you rather be part of that community and not have to worry about any risks? Thank Great. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and conclude our webcast today. But thank you to the wonderful presenters. You all brought so much experience and expertise to the conversation. So thank you. And thank you for the participants for your wonderful questions. Like I said, I'll get you responses as well as the access to the PowerPoint slides, some contact information, and I promised uh, more details about the long and road, long and winding road slides. So we'll see you on the next WCET State Authorization Network webcast.